Hey, welcome back to The Dive. Our guest today has founded one of Montreal's first AI companies and forged his technical skill set at the inception of big data and the web. He will discuss artificial intelligence, its life cycle, AI businesses for the next two decades, and the company's plan for 2022. He is the founder and CEO at Ex Machina AI. Claude Thirouet is joining us today. But before we bring Claude on, just a quick reminder to smash that subscribe button for me, please. Hey, Claude, welcome to The Dive. Hey, Cassandra. Nice to be here. So, Claude, so Claude, we don't get many experts on AI on this show. Let's start off the top here. For our audience, what is AI? And more specifically, what is deep learning? AI is any kind of algorithm that helps a computer either uh, classify information on its own or learn on its own. And the learn part is very controversial. People that, like there's a lot of stuff that falls into AI, there's reinforcement learning, there's normal machine learning, there's supervised learning, there's unsupervised learning. So like that term of AI is huge and it compensates a lot of different algorithms. Uh, deep learning though was really something that's a, it's based on neural networks, okay? And what's happened with deep learning is that the algorithms that we're now seeing change the world. We really developed between two Canadian researchers, Joshua Benjo and Jeffrey Hinton, and Jeffrey Hinton's in Toronto. Yashua Benjo is in Montreal. And the third one's called Yann Lecun. They won the Turing Prize, which is the, uh, the Nobel Prize for computer science. And um, Yann Lecun is the head of AI at Facebook now. So those three people invented, if you want, what we call deep learning. And deep learning, uh, neural networks have been around for a long time. Like in 1991, uh, when I worked at Nortel, we were using neural networks to create the speech recognition that now powers 411. Yeah, that used to be thousands and thousands of operators. So if you want to see how AI can really, you know, displace normal jobs, no, you just have to look at how speech recognition changed that world. And the word AI changes. So in, 19, in 1991, we called that AI. Today, I'm not sure if just neural networks is AI. So the term keeps changing throughout the time. Deep learning, though, is really a specific thing that uses uh, different layers of neural networks to accelerate the process of learning. And that's really been a game changer uh, because uh, when we had the big data revolution, uh, it, it's a big data revolution that actually led to AI because the amount of statistics you need to make a neural network learn is colossal. Okay, So the amount of data that you have to analyze um, usually it's like anywhere from 10,000 instances to 10 million or sometimes more, depending on the complexity of what you're trying to analyze. And so the data stream going up used to slow things down so that deep learning wasn't good. But, you know, when we got storage and big data and processing speeds got a lot faster uh, from 2012 to 2015, that's when deep learning was able to really shine. And so what's really changing the world today is deep learning. Okay, wow, interesting. So where are we right now in this life cycle of AI? You mentioned the 411. Is it, is it common in everyday other platforms as well? Well, yeah, I think the best AI, you don't even see it. Obviously your Facebook feed is run by AI. Uh, it just picks it for you. And if it runs really well, you don't see it. But um, I would say AI is still very early in its adoption curve. Uh, and it's already, uh, you know, when you look at the Geithner hype curve and the, you know, the hype cycle, it's called a lot of things in a, like, let's say the Gartner hype cycle for 2021, uh, there are a lot of types of AI that are now passing what we call the peak of expected inflations. And so machine learning has passed that peak, natural language processing, which is what I used to do at Nexology has passed that peak. Uh, deep learning is now past that peak. And we did a little bit of that as well. Uh, computer vision is in a trough, what we call the trough of disillusionment, okay? So a lot of these technologies, which were really overhyped in from 2016, are starting to like not live up to their expectations. Mm, okay. 
So I heard Kathy Wood has said she sees over $80 trillion in equity uh, value being created from the business in the next 20 years. How big of an opportunity do you see in this? Oh, I, I would agree. I think uh, one of the reasons I think AI is so important is that uh, it's going to be installed in every type of technology where you can have a microchip. Wow. So there's a microchip in your, in, your, in your washer. There's a microchip in your fridge sometimes. Uh, obviously in cars, you know, and that was a bit of a failure, self-driving cars. Uh, you know, Google promised self-driving cars by 2020. And when the biggest engineering company in the world can't deliver, you know it's a hard problem, mm. right? And it can't deliver a lot of it. Like I said earlier, it's a data value chain that we're talking about. Okay. And there's actually 750,000 people worldwide working full-time, just trying to say to the, what we call labeling data, but, and labeling data is saying, well, that's an orange, that's an apple. So the computer can know when it's learning, right? So um, this opportunity is gonna be, there are two types of scientific revolution, basically. Uh, there are convergent scientific revolutions when you take two fields and you merge them together, like biophysics, mm -hmm. right? And then there's emergent, uh, technical revolutions like nanotechnology, which just shows up right across the board in every single thing. And AI is an emergent technical revolution, meaning that it's, it's, it's a, the compute power across the world is going to is increased. And now everywhere where you have big data to train it and everywhere where there's a microchip, you're going to get AI in the next 20 years. Amazing. Okay. So let's talk about your company, X Machina AI. You guys are currently private. What is the high level overview? Well, uh, we're, we're raising uh, privately. We're listing in um, late uh, first quarter 2022. Um, so we are, you know, we have so many investors. There was so much uh, interest in us that we now have, you know, we're almost a public reporting issuer in a sense because uh, we now have over 97 investors who've already put in money. Yeah, it, we oversubscribed <laughs> our seed round by 20% and in 60 days. Amazing. And, yeah, and what's amazing is that we had two investment banks sign letters of engagement with us, Echelon and Hampton, right? And that's cool. never seen for a seed round for a private company. Uh, we're, so obviously we're very happy with that. X Machina basically does, if you want to look at it from a purely financial point of view, it fills a gap in the funding of AI. Uh, funding AI companies um, is not like funding normal software. There are a lot of extra costs. Talent is very rare. And you need to fully understand what I call the data value chain. And uh, if you don't do that, you're going to lose a lot of money. So within X Machine AI, we have the expertise. Like we have uh, Daniel Duroy, who has who founded one of the first seed VCs in the country and raised $50 million and did a lot of deals as a VC. We have Von DeMarco, who was hired. Uh, he's done two AI startups himself and was hired by one of the investment um, funds, government investment funds in Quebec. And he's done, he's invested $20 million in the past three years in, in 30 companies, and he's done 200 due diligences of AI companies. Oh so we're putting together one of the best AI investment due diligence, but also the talent around AI is very rare. So uh, we just acquired our first uh, kind of like product company, uh, AI, sorry, um, service company. Uh, we mm -hmm. call it the value creation team. And they're one of the best product uh, consultancies in Montreal right now. And they work with four of the AI accelerators already in the city. So they have, we, we are also acquiring the talent around AI, the sales talent, the IT talent, but also the product design talent. Uh, inside the founder team, we have Daniel Arsenault, who was in-house uh, designer for Y Combinator. So if you use WebEx, if you use uh, Dropbox, he designed those. Oh, wow. Right? Yeah, he designed Airbnb and, and parts of Farmville. So he's one of the best designers in the world. In fact, he designed our founder deck. So we can bring that talent to, to AI companies that we acquire, which Amazing. is gonna make them really accelerate. Mm -hmm, definitely. Okay, so for when you're acquiring a company, how do you do your due diligence? And do you have some sort of metrics in identifying companies that will achieve their target growth? Absolutely. So the great 
response we have is that we want to work within the ecosystem. The response we've had from public investors has been amazing. In a lot of ways, um, people look at this as arbitrage between public and private markets of AI. There's very little um, growth happening inside the small cap world in AI because people don't know which one to pick. But what we are picking is that for VCs inside the VC portfolio, um, there's a bunch of companies that, you know, if you're only going to do like a factor of 50% growth a year, it's not enough for a VC. It sounds amazing for public markets, right? Um, but for a VC, you really to get a series A, it's 50% growth per year minimum, usually at least factor of two growth per year. That's what they're looking at. So we want to work and so far uh, the, you know, the response of VCs has been amazing and accelerated as well, is that they don't know what to do often with the companies that are just growing like a normal business. So our investment criteria is that the company usually needs to have half a million dollars of what we call uh, annually recurring revenue, ideally okay. in the product. So that means that the company has solved some element of product market fit. What we're also looking at as a criteria is that they be break even because we don't want to have to get in there and fix it. Mm -hmm. okay? Like I, we're not like a private equity at all. We're there to provide additional services. And when we acquire a company, we invest in the company. That's where the, most of the cash goes, in fact. So okay. we want to be able to partner with companies that are inside VC portfolios, but don't meet the really hard requirements to get a follow-on financing. So for VCs, it's a win because they get an exit. For founders, it's an incredible win because they get to fund their dream. But we also give the founders uh, you know, a, a steady exit inside a public company. Okay. And Perfect. for accelerators, they love it because they could get uh, some people to acquire the companies right out of the accelerator. And of course, the public markets absolutely adore it because the public market investors are getting access to companies that are growing at 20 to 30% year over year, uh, which is, you know, in the wow. public markets is amazing. Mm -hmm. Enormous growth opportunity. So, so you're a former astrophysicist. What made you decide to make the move to becoming an entrepreneur? Oh, boys. Well, I founded the astronomy department at McGill, and uh, I got lots of scholarships. I was invited by the French Academy of Sciences to uh, work in France, and I lived in Paris for six years. Uh, we helped prove there's a supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy. Uh, we built an astounding, like, very huge array of telescopes in Namibia. It's called the Hess Array. And when I was at McGill, McGill happened to build the 10th biggest supercomputer in the non-military world. And so what people in astrophysics do and particle physics, where you work at these massive accelerators, is that the data com computation is just literally astronomical. So the data we were taking at that telescope um, was so voluminous that it was cheaper for us to fly it back to Paris than to transfer it over the tent. Cheaper and faster, okay? Crazy. So, and I designed the algorithms that sift through that data and only find the good signals. That was my job. Wow. So I, I'll, even though I was an astrophysicist, I did a lot of what we call data acquisition and data cleaning. Mm -hmm. And that's a two very important steps of the data, um, the data value chain. You can't train an AI if the data is not clean. Like if you have, you're trying to train it on oranges, but you have a whole bunch of cucumbers in the data, the computer is going to make larger errors. So the data cleaning part of uh, big data is one of the hardest and longest parts, but I became an expert in that. Uh, and I did it with statistical methods and fun things like that. So I had a pretty illustrious career as an astrophysicist, uh, published twice in Nature, uh, got a lot of scholarships, very competitive. And then I, uh, I hurt myself and I missed a publishing season, spent six months in the hospital. And that was like a big time of reflection. It was really like, hmm, do I want to keep moving cities every two years? Do I want to, you know, I kept, obviously the telescopes are in very remote regions. So I had to travel for 10 years. The longest I was in one place was six weeks. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I don't and know how you did that. Weeks, that was six weeks at the telescope. Oh so I was like, okay, I think I've done enough of this. And I was 35 and I'd given myself uh, the goal of being a tenure track position in an Ivy League school. And I didn't achieve it. 
so I said, okay, I didn't meet my goal. I'm quitting this. And I, I started doing sociology, uh, quantitative sociology. And that's where Nixology was born. Okay. So we were analyzing patents and scientific articles in Paris. And I was like, hmm, there's this thing called a blog. And it's super free. And it's like they're exploding across the world. This is when Google uh, bought Blogger. And okay. so I developed algorithms to go get blog data at Google. We had, and then crunch all the, the natural language processing. By the time we built all that ourselves. And so we got massive clients like Ford. We got agency of the year in the US, Droga 5. And of course, we got the Canadian military as a client. Oh my. And that was kind of like my transition from uh, being a pure academic to an AI entrepreneur. The key thing is, again, that, that famous data value chain. So a lot of physicists, in fact, end up being the people who are in the early fields like AI. Amazing. It sounds problem. like you've had quite the ride. Oh my gosh. It was fun. <laughs> okay, so one more thing before we let you go here, Claude. What's the plan for 2022? Well, we're listing in the uh, first quarter of 2022, so we're very busy. Uh, we've acquired our first company. We're going to announce that. Uh, it's coming out this week. And uh, we're, we're raising a $4 million round at 25 cents, which is going to be led by Hanson Securities. So uh, ideally, we are building our, uh, our deal flow with various VCs and accelerators. And our goal is to acquire six more companies in the next two years. Oh, my gosh. Big dreams. I love it. Well, thank you so much for joining us today on The Dive, Claude. It was nice talking to you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for tuning in today. We'll be back again tomorrow with the latest news and updates. So be sure to stay tuned by hitting that notification bell and subscribing below.